I'm Drew Stevenson. This is a video for my professional responsibility class. Here we're going to be talking about ABA Model Rule 6.5. 6.5 is about limited legal service programs, and these are typically pro bono clinics that might be run by a courthouse or a legal aid clinic or sometimes a domestic violence uh, shelter where lawyers can volunteer to come in most often on a Saturday morning and do free consultations, little advice sessions with people who are not going to become ongoing clients of the lawyer, but in instead intend to continue um, in pro se or representing themselves. And so the what they really need a lot of times is just someone to give them uh, some basic information, answer a few questions, give them some guidance, and maybe help them fill out the forms for the court or an administrative agency. So Model Rule 6.5, the ABA's title for it is Nonprofit and Court Annexed Limited Legal Service Programs. It's kind of a mouthful, but as I said, the example or prototypical example is a Saturday morning pro bono clinic operated by a courthouse, a domestic violence shelter, or a legal aid clinic. And lawyers basically volunteer to give brief one-time consultations to the people who show up at, um, seeking legal advice. Now, 6.5a starts by saying, a lawyer who, under the auspices of a program sponsored by a nonprofit organization or court, provides short-term limited legal services to a client without expectation by either the lawyer or the client that the lawyer will provide continuing representation in the matter one is subject to rules 1.7 and 1.9a only if the lawyer knows that the representation of the client involves a conflict of interest. So I want to stop right there, make sure you understand what that just said. Um, basically, normally 1.7 is our basic conflicts of interest rule for your current clients. So you have a new prospective person coming in for a consultation and if they have a conflict of interest with someone else you are currently representing, that would come under 1.7. And 1.9 is about former clients. Normally, a lawyer would have to not really give legal advice or get that much into the matter of, the, of this prospective client without doing a thorough check for conflicts of interest or conflicts check, as we call it. And what this is saying is you don't have to do that. Um, for every person that you talk to, if you volunteer at one of these sort of pro bono clinics, giving these one-time situations. With the exception of someone starts talking to you and you realize immediately that you do in fact have a conflict of interest, that the other party in the matter that they're talking about, or they have a legal dispute with someone who you know off the top of your head is one of your other clients or a former client who you represented on a substantially related matter. So if you know, then you can't do the consultation, but otherwise you can proceed and give some legal advice and not worry about doing the typical conflicts check that you would have to do for other clients. Now let's move on to 6.5A2. A lawyer in one of these situations is subject to rule 1.10 only if the lawyer knows that another lawyer associated with a lawyer in a law firm is disqualified by 1.7 or 1.9a with respect to the matter. Now, 1.10 is our imputation rule and which requires kind of elaborate screening procedure. So if a lawyer, at one lawyer in the firm and only one lawyer in the firm would have a conflict of interest and they're not going to be involved in the matter at all, and they're not currently representing the other party, sometimes we will kind of zone them off from any communication about or participation in the representation. What this is saying is that we don't really have to worry about screening for these consultations, again, unless it's immediately evident or obvious to the lawyer when someone starts talking in their half hour consultation or however long it is, that what they're talking about is something that another lawyer in the same firm is on the other side or has recently been on the other side of the same matter. Usually that's not going to be in the case. And so normally you won't have to worry about screening under 1.10. 6.5b says, except is provided in A2, that's what we just talked about, 
Rule 1.10 is inapplicable to a representation governed by this rule. So in other words, you don't have to worry about screening lawyers um, and or providing notice or the other requirements of the imputation rule. Let's talk about just a few of the comments here that the ABA provided with the rule that I think will be helpful to keep in mind for answering test questions on the MPRE. They do ask about 6.5 from time to time on the MPRE, and I'm going to basically just hit the highlights for you of things that I think could turn into test questions on a multiple choice exam or on my exam. So first, by just by way of introduction, the ABA explains that limited legal advice or the completion of legal forms sometimes can help someone handle their legal problems themselves without further representation by a lawyer. And they give some examples. Sometimes these are not even in-person meetings. It's a legal advice hotline, and lawyers basically volunteer to man the hotline uh, for a few hours on a weekend. They could be advice-only clinics, pro se counseling programs, and so forth. Now, this is very important. Keep this in mind for test questions. A client-lawyer relationship is established during those few minutes that you spend talking to the person. But there is no expectation that the lawyer's representation of the client will continue beyond the limited consultation. So this means that some rules could be triggered because they are a client while you're talking to them. It's just a special type of client under 6.5 where you don't have to screen for conflicts. But for example, we're going to see in a moment, some of the other rules would apply. And if you gave horrible advice to someone, in theory, they could sue you for legal malpractice because you had a client lawyer relationship during that brief advice session. Now, in these quick sessions, the ABA acknowledges that Normally, it's simply not feasible for a lawyer to systematically screen for conflicts of interest, and that is what you would normally have to do for a, before undertaking a typical representation. So, and also keep in mind that the client has to be aware and agree that this is a one-off, that this is a one-time meeting, and that you're not going to provide any further legal help. Uh, to them after this brief advice session. So uh, as the comment says, a lawyer who provides short-term limited legal services pursuant to this rule must obtain the client's informed consent to the limited scope of the representation. The same would be required under 1.2c, which is about the um, scope of the representation. What this means in practice is that normally you're going to begin every one of these advice sessions getting this out of the way and saying, do you understand that I'm giving you advice right now? I will help you um, listen to your legal problem, advise you, tell you how the law works, maybe help you fill out the court forms or the agency forms, and then we're done and I will be involved after this. And they will have to understand and give consent. Most lawyers will get the consent in writing before they proceed with the session just to, to be able to show later that they got the consent. Now, some clients, actually, you're going to realize when you start talking to them, they aren't going to be able to handle their matter themselves at all. So if a short-term limited legal representation is really not reasonable under the circumstances, but you didn't want to take this kind of case, you can give legal advice, but the legal advice needs to include hey, you really need to find a lawyer. You either need to get the money to pay it, hire a lawyer, or you need to convince a legal aid clinic to take your case or a lawyer to take your case pro bono. And it's, it's okay for you to go ahead and do the session, but you have to advise them that it's really not feasible for them to handle the matter uh, themselves if you realize it. Now, some matters uh, you can't, right? So if you go to housing court in most cities, most of the tenants who are facing eviction are representing themselves. Most of the people in traffic court are representing themselves. A lot of people go to their social security disability hearings and represent themselves. And so that's possible, but there are some matters where you may realize that the person doesn't have a chance and they really, really shouldn't go any further without having somebody represent them. And if that's the case, then you have an obligation under 6.5 to tell them that. 
Keep in mind that apart from the rules that were mentioned, 1.7, 1.9, 1.10, the other model rules do apply to that session that you have with the client. So, and they specifically mention um, 1.6 and 1.9C, which are basically confidentiality rules. In other words, if you do volunteer one of these clinics, the things that these people tell you, you still have a duty of confidentiality. You can't publicize it or share it or um, talk about it with other people. You have to keep it confidential like you would for a regular client. And some of the other rules could apply uh, too. Those are the ones that are singled out here by the ABA. Comment 4 says that the um, that comment B, which was about how 1.10 is basically inapplicable, unless you know that uh, uh, from the outset that there's a conflict, that the lawyer's participation in this type of program will not preclude the lawyer's firm from undertaking or continuing the representation of a client with interests adverse to a client being represented under the program's auspices. In other words, you did a session, um, with a consultation with a client, let, let's say last month at one of these pro bono clinics, and now you are a, 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 someone comes to you a new client and they want you to represent them and they have a claim. It could be for property damage against the person or it's a landlord wanting to evict the person or something like that. They don't count as a full-fledged former client for purposes of um, you having a conflict or the lawyer who did the consultation needing to be screened from the matter. And similarly, the personal disqualification of a lawyer participating in the program will not be imputed to other lawyers participating in the program. And so let's say that um, it, what, someone who comes into one of these clinics seeking a consultation and, and advice is someone that you have a personal history with, right? It's your um, an ex-partner, ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or ex-spouse. Um, that's not going to be imputed if other lawyers from your firm also go and volunteer. They could do a counseling session for that person and you wouldn't have to worry about that personal conflict of interest being imputed. Comment five presents the interesting this, uh, scenario. This is probably the except going to be exceptional or rare circumstance where the lawyer hears what the person says during this brief consultation and decides that they actually want to undertake a full representation. They want to go ahead and continue representing this person and see them through to the end of their matter. And so if a lawyer decides to continue to represent, represent the client in the matter on an ongoing basis after one of these limited consultations, then all of these other rules kick in, right? So then rule 1.7, 1.9a and 1.10 become applicable. In other words, then you would need to screen for conflicts of interest. We'll have imputation and, and screening. We'll, we'll have to do a very thorough conflicts check and so forth if you want to go further than this initial consultation. You can, and you're allowed to do that. So someone tells you their story and you realize, wow, I'm really passionate about this, um, uh, this matter. And I, uh, I want to go ahead and, and stick with this person and help them uh, through to the end. You can, and, but at that point, now they've become a regular client. So we're kind of out from the coverage of 6.5 and you would have to do the same types of conflicts checks that you would for a normal client. And that concludes our brief lecture about ABA model rule 6.5.